Hello everyone, it's been a while, it's currently steaming hot outside, so hopefully none of these bugs burns, um, unless the bad ones, of course. Um, I have usually make these videos in the beginning of the year, although it is May, and I did check it was May. Um, I decided to do it anyways because I had some free time, and my mom took my dog to PetSmart. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's for grooming dogs and cleaning them and whatnot. So here are the books I'm reading. The Lonely Crowd by David Riesman. It starts with an essay, which is quite interesting. I finished the essay 10 years later. I'll read you the introduction. Uh, also, it's with Raul, that's R-U-R-E-U-E-L. For some reason, Denny and Nathan Glazer. So here's the blurb on the back, employing an ironical and fresh approach to the evaluation of changing American character. This study by brilliant social psychologist and his co-workers in one of the first attempts to explore the consequences for our day of the quote abyss of leisure end quote, which has opened before us with industrialization and shortening work day and the shortening work life, where the quote inner directed, which is explored in the beginnings of the book, man, as the authors termed the typical 19th century person who had clear goals and righteously pursued them, in parentheses, used to treat into his hobbies in the little spar time he had, his quote other directed successor exploits as much greater leisure as a lonely member of a lonely crowd, desperately engaged in having fun, end quote. But the authors also believe that the other directed man who learned in this childhood to look to others for clues as to how to live and especially as to how to consume his leisure is capable of becoming more independent of others. They have written a whole and thought-provoking book on the subject. So I found out about this book through Clark Ellison's, Ellison's video. Um, I'll reference it at the end or at the bottom of the description. It's quite interesting and I'm planning on, I'm taking extensive notes so it's going to take a while, maybe the end of the year or half, it's already half the year, never mind. Here's Out of Dark by Cormac McCarthy. Cormac McCarthy is my favorite writer of all time, next to Faulkner and John Milton. This book is about sometime around the turn of the last century. A woman in Appalachia bears her brother's child, a boy. The brother leaves the baby in the woods and tells his sister the child died of natural causes. Discovering her brother's life, she sets forth alone to find her son. Both brother and sister wander separately through a countryside, being scourged by three terrifying and elusive strangers headlong towards an eerie apocalyptic resolutions, and most of McCarthy's endings are apocalyptic and biblical as per Revelations is concerned. To make you understand why I like Cormac McCarthy, I'll read you if it won't take me forever. Building the suspense. Um, here, they caught quote. They crossed. They crested out on the bluff in the late afternoon sun, with their shadows long on the saw grass and burnt sedge, moving single file and slowly high above the river, and with something of its own impl implacability, pausing and grouping for a moment, and going on again, swung out in the silhouette against the sun and then dropping under the crest of the hill into a fold of blue shadow with light, touching them about the head in a spurious sancti sanctity until they had gone on for such a time as they saw as saw the sun down altogether and they moved in a shadow altogether which suited them very well. When they reached, that was all one sentence by the way, when they reached the river, it was full dark, and they made a camp and a small fire across 
was full dark. Uh, sorry about that. When they reached the river, it was full dark, and they made a camp and a small fire across which their shapes moved in a nameless black bullet. They cooked whatever it was they had with them in whatever crude vessels and turned in to sleep, sprawled on the packed mud full of clothes with their mouths gaped to the stars. They were about with the first light, the bearded one rising and kicking out the other two, and still with no word, so with no word among them rekindling the fire and setting their battered panicans about about it, squatting on their bunches, bunches eating again, orderly with belt knives, and until the bearded one rose and stood spattered legged, spattered legged before the fire and closed the other two in a foul white plume of smoke out of and through which they fought suddenly and unannounced and mute and as suddenly ceased picking up their rag, ragged duffel and move, moving west along the river once again. That was a real bad reading. Uh, I promise I'm not drunk. I'm drinking tea instead. But I do mostly read McCarthy for his prose. Such is a bit aimless. It's a 400 masterpiece, but it is an aimless one. And some people like that. Some people are more plot driven. Um, so anyways, I don't know how to pronounce this author's name, but here it goes. Snorri Strolason, The Prose Edda. It's a Norse mythology book, and I'm reading Norse mythology because I just saw the Northmen by Robert Eggers, so I'll read the back. The Prose Edda is the most renowned of all works of Scandinavian literature and our most extensive, extensive source for Norse mythology. Written in Iceland a century after the close of the Viking Age, it tells ancient stories of the Norse creation epic and recounts the battles that follow as gods, giants, dwarves, and elves struggle for survival. It also preserves the oral memory of heroes, warrior kings, and queens in clear prose into interspersed with powerful verse. The Edda provides unparalleled insight into the gods' tragic realization that the future holds one final cataclysmic battle, Ragnarok, when the world will be destroyed. These tales from the pagan era have proved to be among the most influential of all myths and legends, inspiring, inspiring modern works as diverse as Wagner's Ring Cycle and Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. So, I haven't read The Lord of the Rings, but I have read The Hobbit for some reason. It's, it was alright. Um, followed the hero's myth pretty accurately. Here is J. K. G. K. Chesterton, the everlasting man. So on the back, this is this is his whole view of the world history as informed by the incarnation, beginning with the origin of man and the various religious attitudes throughout history. Chesterton shows how the fulfillment of man's of all man's desires take place in the person <coughs> of Christ and in Christ. Church. Chesterton propounds, propounds the thesis that those who say that Christ stands side by side with similar myths and his religion side by side with similar religions are only repeating a very stale formula contradicted by a very striking fact. And with all the brilliance and devastating irony so characteristic of his best of writing, Chesterton gleefully and tempestuously tempestuously tears to shreds that very stale formula and triumphantly proclaims in vivid language the glory and unanswerable logic of that view striking fact very striking fact here is a genius of Chesterton that is delighted best in the mood quote in the mood of clarity which the author creates for us the sense of wonder and awe at the universe at God and man 
Mr. Chesterton performs a miracle which comes well in this sophisticated age of scorn. So there is this documentary who, whose director, I forgot, um, the zeitgeist, in which he draws parallels to the cult of Mithra and relates it to the Jesus myth or tale, if you will. If you're interested in that, it's free on YouTube. All, all the zeitgeist movies are free. So this big book is Neil Price, Children of Ash, and um, it's another Viking book, Children of Ash and Elm. So here's the back, or maybe the side. The Viking Age from 750 to 1050 saw an unprecedented expansion of the Scandinavian peoples into the wide world. As traders and raiders, explorers, and colonists they range from Eastern North America to Asian Steppe. Step but for centuries, the Vikings have been seen through the eyes of others, distorted to suit the taste of medieval cler cler clerics and Elizabethan playwrights, Victorian imperialists, Nazis, and more. None of, the mo none of these appropriations capture the real Vikings for the richness and sophistication of the culture. Based on the latest archaeolog archaeological and textual evidence, Children of Ash and Elm tells the story of Vikings on their own terms, their politics, their cosmology, and religion. Their material world, known today for a stereotype of maritime violence, the Vikings exported new ideas, technologies, beliefs, and practices to the lands they discovered and the people they encountered, and in the process, for themselves change. From Eric, Eric Bodex, who fought his way to a kingdom to Gudrid, can't pronounce the last name, the most traveled woman in the world, children of Ashenelm, in a definitive history of the Vikings in the time. Again, this is a Vikings novel, and I'm mainly reading it because I enjoyed the Northmen very much. Seven aside from Vikings, but not faring too off the path of long, unnecessarily long books. I'm interested in the Civil War because Faulkner was a Civil War student or scholar, more accurately. So I try to follow the footsteps of my favorite writers, although not all of them, as they some of them don't live suitable lives. Here is Gods and Generals, a novel of the Civil War. Another Civil War novel and another massive book that is too heavy to carry with you while you walk to your library um, is The Battle Cry of Freedom, The Civil War Era by James M. McPeterson. Uh, here is the blurb on the side. Filled with fresh interpretations and information, puncturing old myths and challenging new ones, Battle Cry of Freedom will unquestionably become the standard one volume history of the Civil War. James Vick Peterson's fast paced narrative fully integrates the political, social, and military events that crowded the two decades from the outbreak of one war in Mexico to the ending of another at Appomattox. Packed with drama and analytical insight, the book vividly recounts the momentous episodes. That preceded the Civil War, the Dred Scott decision, the Lincoln Douglas debates, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, and then moves into a masterful chronicle of the war itself, the battles, the strategic maneuvering of both sides, the politics, and the personalities. Particularly notable are McPherson's new views on such matters as a slavery expansion issue in the 1850s, the origins the Republican Party, the causes of secession, internal dissent, and anti-war opposition in the North and the South, and the reasons for the Union's victory. The book title ref refers to the sentiments that inform the Northern and Southern views of the conflict. The South seceded in the name of their freedom of self-determination 
and self-government for which their fathers had fought in 1776 while the North stood fast in defense of the Union founded by those fathers as the bulwark of American liberty. Eventually, the North had to grapple with the underlying cause of the war, slavery, and adopt a policy of emancipation as a second war aim. This new birth of freedom at Lincoln College constitutes the proudest legacy of America's bloodiest conflicts. This, this authoritative volume makes sense of that vast and confusing second American Revolution we call it the Civil War, a war that transformed a nation and expanded our heritage of liberty. So that's that. Um, a shorter book is I Am the Selected Poetry of John Clare. Now if you're a Penny Dreadful man Penny Dreadful fan like me, then you know that one of the I forgot his name, but one of the characters uh, changed their name to John Clare, but which I suspect it was a reference to something, and it was it was a reference to John Clare, who wrote "I Am." So here is Marcia Allade, a history of religious ideas, volume one. Not much to say on this; it is as is described. Hold on, let me put these books aside. So I can barely pick this up. It's about 20,000 pages long. Um, it's called The Three Books of Occult Philosophy, written by Henry Cornelius Agrippa of Net Netashim, completely annotated with modern commentary, the foundation book of Western occultism. Now I'm not an occultist, but I do like having different ideas in my head, so that's mainly why I'm reading it. These two difficult books, Arthur Schopenhauer, The World as Well of Representation, is been on a long want to read on my list because he as we all know, Schopenhauer influenced Nietzsche, and as we all know, Schopenhauer, um, Nietzsche eventually overcame Schopenhauer as he did with all other philosophers in the past. I've been reading this book forever. It's taking ages. It's Martin Heidegger's Being in Time. Um, let me read you the back. What is the meaning of being? This is a central question of Martin Heidegger's profoundly important work in which the great philosopher seeks to explain the basic problems of existence. A central influence of later philosophy, literature, art, and criticism, as well as existentialism, and much of postmodern thought. Being in time forever changes the intellectual map of the modern world. As Richard Rorty wrote in the New York Times book review, quote, you cannot read most of the important thinkers of recent times without taking Heidegger's thought into account, end quote. Agreed. Much agreed. The first paperback edition of John McQuarrie's and Edward Robinson's definitive translation also features a new forward by Heidegger scholar Taylor Carman. I do like this cover. It is quite cool. So these are all my tabs. Um, I did complete this in the hospital when I was 18. I don't know how I did this, but when you're in the hospital, there's nothing to do but watch TV and go to groups or play cards with people. Um, yeah, that's about it. Let me know what you're reading in the comments, and I'll be forward to the next video. Ciao.